Hey guys, welcome to the Convo Couch. I'm Sun, and today we've got musician, educator, mental health and disability advocate Jesse Wang. Hey, <laughs> thanks for coming on. No worries. I'm pleasure to be here. <laughs> So I actually ended up picking a psychology degree at first and then wanted to kind of like incorporate music in there somewhere. But then I just like, I just had to deal with so much bureaucracy. I ended up getting a letter from a university basically saying like, what are you doing? Like, this isn't part of your degree. Like music is not a part of it. So I was like, hmm, okay, identity crisis moment. <laughs> and then I ended up going back to the music degree, finishing that. So then now I'm back to my psychology degree. Right. So, so you've done your music degree at the con. Mm -hmm. Now you're in the middle of a psychology degree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so how do you feel like you're sort of going to try and merge the two? Um, a lot of what I do right now kind of merges the two together. So one of my jobs is also um, working at a charity that combines music and mental health. So uh, one of the things is like we bring music therapy for those with like chronic mental illnesses. Um, and another key thing about what we do is we promote kind of conversations about mental health among those in the music industry as well. So I kind of feel like the more the more that I do, well, the more that I work, the more kind of like similarities that I find with my music and mental health. So it's it, it's been really really good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For example, the thing with a lot of mental illnesses is they find it really hard to um, like articulate how they're feeling and they also kind of don't want to talk about how they're actually feeling as well. But then with music, it's kind of it's something that kind of directly touches you. It's also something that can kind of um, uh, affect your emotions and kind of make you want to well empower you to like um like act upon it as well um that's one way and then there's like there's like a okay so that's like that's the like passive music therapy where you're just kind of receiving but then there's also like active music therapy where you're like kind of participating and you're for example creating music you are writing music that kind of thing and that is also a really empowering process as well because you are you have being given uh, an opportunity to kind of create something and like and for someone with a mental illness where you feel like the whole world is constantly throwing things at you and you often feel really powerless and like going through that music therapy process becomes a really powerful and life-changing experience as well. So is that a formal process that people go through or they go to certain organizations or institutions for that or do they just do it themselves? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of you can kind of you can kind of do both. Um so there are some music therapy music therapists who work in um in like hospital settings or like um, mental health organizations would organize that kind of thing. But um but the whole point of like the of music therapy is that it's it's very much like an interactive um like process. It's not so much the therapist is like throwing knowledge at you and just throwing music at you <laughs> that kind of thing it is very much like you are a part of it and it's more like a partnership something else that's really kind of um prevalent at the moment is the use of music therapy for those in um in aged care settings especially people who are kind of suffering from early stages of alzheimer's um and dementia and because because they're kind of they're kind of failing to well remember a lot of things but then they hear like a piece of music that was um, kind of really popular in, for example, when they were in their 20s, and then suddenly all the memories associated with it would like come back. Um, and I've heard stories about how like, like not even music therapists, even just like nurses and like um, nursing home workers who have gone in and just like, just played a piece of music and then hearing them like suddenly talk for the very first time in like years, that kind of thing. So it, yeah, it is very empowering. So you mentioned you went to Cambodia to help out some kids as well at some point. Yeah, yeah. So I um so when I was in year twelve, it was a time when everyone was um kind of organizing for schoolies. And like um even when I was in high school I just hated parties <laughs> and I was like, I don't I really don't want to do schoolies at all. I wanted to do something that was kind of like meaningful. And so I thought about, well, Cambodia maybe, just because it's kind of it's close enough to home. I had heard a little bit about it um and how like just just like how much help they needed so i ended up doing that when i was a fresh 18 year old out of high school <laughs> like traveling alone for the very first time that kind of thing and that was it was really really eye-opening so it was um it was 
So I was doing some music teaching at an orphanage. Um, and these kids had like, they had never like seen any of the instruments that I had brought before. And I was like, but these are just like simple percussion instruments, like a maracas. Um, and even just things like teaching them to like play on the table, teaching them simple rhythms, that kind of thing. Like they had kind of never had that experience. And for me, that was really eye opening to think, wow, but like, but something like a rhythm is so intuitive and it touch it touches you kind of like so quickly as well, but they've just like never had that. They've never had the collaborative musical experience. So yeah, it, it was very, very eye opening. And I felt like that was kind of what um, set me out on a path to bringing music for those people who don't normally have access to it again. So okay. yeah. So that was quite a big decision you made, I guess, like right out of high school, 18 years old, you decided to go to Cambodia. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. So did your parents like uh, have any opinion on that? <laughs> um, they were kind of, I mean, I feel like I feel like they always knew I I really like helping people as well. So they were they were supportive of it, but also they were like quite worried. Yeah, <laughs> I'd imagine. Like, yeah. just eighteen year old just by yourself yeah. going to Cambodia. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like I I um I did end up lying to them and go, oh, but I'll be with other volunteers. It'll be okay, that kind of thing. But I ended up being like the only teacher at this orphanage. Wow. <laughs> My yeah. gosh. Did you tell them afterwards when you're back? Or no? They're no. They never knew. <laughs> no, well, they know now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do know now. Wow. That's okay. And like, I, I did, I did like show them some pictures and was like, oh, actually, I was alone most of the time. So, wow. yeah. My gosh. Yeah. They must have had a heart attack or something when they saw those pictures. Yeah. Like, where are the other volunteers? It's just yeah. you yeah. and a whole bunch of kids. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh. But um, but I don't know. I feel like I feel like that also kind of um put me into into uh well because even even before I went there I thought I was gonna have like other volunteers with me as well so that was I guess a shock at first but it also forced me to become independent and I guess when you're doing when you're doing stuff like bringing music to those people who don't normally have access to it like just because there aren't a lot of people who are doing that kind of stuff so most of the time you are kind of on your own anyway <laughs> yeah so I feel I feel like if anything that really helped with like it just um, being independent and like coming up with original ideas and like reaching out to people, which is so important as well. And you mentioned as well when you went to Cambodia and sort of taught these children like rhythms and like all these basic things that mm-hmm. you find so intuitive. What are some of the original ideas that you played around with them? Um, so a lot of this, a lot of um, a lot of my teaching were based on um, like improvisation, group improvisation especially, and it's really effective with like little percussion instruments as well, because like every kid can kind of like make a sound out of them as well, and like and also because because these kids lived in an orphanage, so um, and so because they live in an orphanage they kind of they don't have a lot of experiences with like self-expression that kind of thing because everything has just they've just been made to feel really powerless the whole time and so for um for us to kind of like just sit around in a circle and like everyone gets a turn to like improvise on their instrument and then everyone else like follows and like copies their rhythm that kind of thing i found i found that just kind of it made a lot of difference on their self-confidence the whole industry doesn't really help with like mental health issues i guess so like one of the things is it's very much stigmatized so a lot of people are thinking oh i i can't seek out help because it shows that i'm weak that kind of thing but it's also it is very very common to have like mental health issues because of things like i mean everybody's future is kind of uncertain um and even things like um all the stress that comes from like six hours of rehearsals every day um and the pressure you put on self to be like perfect to like keep practicing a piece and keep practicing a section over and over and over again to make it perfect as well um and also just like just an unhealthy lifestyle when you think about it most musicians are playing nighttime concerts and they will finish at like 10 p.m and of course after you've like put so much energy into it um you would be pretty hungry afterwards but then at 10 p.m you're pretty limited to what you can eat and drink so then a lot of people kind of turn to like a drinking smoking that kind of thing and that also that also affects your mental health and that kind of turns into like a vicious cycle because that becomes your coping mechanism whenever you're stressed you turn to drinking or like smoking as well and then it just escalates from there 
So, what are the, some of the ways that you can sort of combat mental health in the industry? Well, one of the one of the main things that I'm trying to do is to just get people to talk about it. Um, is to just get people to discuss like w- like what I'm experiencing right now. Um, rather than rather than thinking, well, I cannot talk about my own issues because I'm weak, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and because because one of the most important things about like a mental health is to actually have a support system as well. And if you don't talk, and so if you don't talk about it, like. People don't know <laughs> how you're feeling. Um, yeah, and and I think and I think in the music industry, everyone just kind of has the idea that I have to act strong as well. Um, and then, obviously, if if everyone kind of pretends to be acting strong, then <laughs> then kind of like a no kind of no support comes out of it as well. It becomes like a really unhealthy competition instead. <laughs> I've personally had like um, had a period where I just um, I had really really bad like um, mental health and and for me it was it was mostly because of peer pressure um, and so that's why that's why I'm I'm all about like having a supportive network nowadays. So back in the day, um, this was when I was in high school. Um, I just I thought I just. I always had the feeling that I wasn't good enough, um, and it, and it just it became so bad. But I I like I know it's actually it's so common for people to feel like that, and like in at the university institution as well, it's also so common. Just because everything in music is kind of predicated upon like competition and always being the best, and you can only it's almost like you can only succeed if you win these competitions, um, and then. I guess an unhealthy way that people do it is to push other people down. <laughs> yeah, and that's just kind of what I'm trying to combat. <laughs> okay, so um, so this is something that I do. This makes it, this is easier when you have um when you have a couple of um like different people or a couple of different groups. Well, we can do it with like two. So this this kind of gets them thinking in like math mode as well. <laughs> so can you? Can you do that? Three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, that's gonna be your pattern. Can you continue that? And I'll do something else. <laughs> I go out of time very easily. That's okay, that's okay. <laughs> and I'll do one that's three. <laughs> that's gonna throw me off. <laughs> Just telling you. But uh, yeah, you can try. Okay, but but also we're gonna add another layer. I want you to tell me how many times you do that before we are together again, and before we clap our lap together again. Uh, why don't, yeah, okay. We can try. We can try me not going out of time first. Okay. And then I'll start counting. Yep. Okay. Good. You're in time. I believe in you. <laughs> that's because you're like tapping your three now. <laughs> okay, that's all right. I'll start my three now. <laughs> oh, we were together. Now. So how many times did you go? <laughs> uh, I was kind of like focusing on myself. <laughs> <laughs> what time? What? No, not yet. Okay, so when time there? So Three? how many times did you go? <laughs> Three? Three? Was it three? Yes, it was three. Yes, yes, I got it right. Oh my gosh. Uh, no, yeah, so that was um that was you four and me three. So then if you do the math, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> that makes right. sense. But then like um. But then like the next stages, I would add like a five into it as well. Okay. And then like, if you have more people, you would add six and seven. And then like the kids will get really excited and go, oh my gosh, we're together. That kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, how would the kids react to that? I was like, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they'll be like happy with this part, but yeah. how they did. It. Yeah, like- exactly. So they're kind of, they're really confused and they're just kind of continuing on what they're doing first. And then like when they realize they suddenly have like that, like thigh slap together, they're like, okay. whoa. So it's exactly like how I did it just yeah. then. Yeah. I was pretty like, much, right, pretty cool. much. So you did yes. well. All right, thank you. Just <laughs> a life experimentation on like on a fully adult human being. <laughs> It sounds so corny, but it's just like you and like your beautiful nature. And also, if you were dancing with a Latino guy, they would be like, oh, move your hips as well. Oh, okay. 